I'm Wes. I'm one of the pastors here. Good to uh, be with you all today and excited to uh, spend some time now together in God's Word. Do what we do each Sunday. Look at a passage, talk about what it means, why it matters, and what we should do about it. So if you have a Bible with you, a Bible app, any way to access the Scriptures. Uh, There's even a Bible under the seat in front of you. If you want to turn today to Genesis 37, starting at midway through verse 17. Genesis 37 And today, mixing things up here, I'm not going to ask you to stand because we're going to cover a lot here. We're going to cover the entire life of Joseph, one message, so I just, I don't want to ask that much of you. So just receive as we (laughs) read together um, from God's Word. We're looking at, yeah, the life of Joseph. Um, If you've never heard this story before, incredible story of God's working in someone's life. Joseph, a 17-year-old boy, when we're first introduced to him, um, who is the second youngest of 12 brothers, a lot of kids in this family, and by all accounts, he's the favorite. Uh, Jacob, who we looked at last week, this is uh, Jacob's favorite son, and he shows him that by, if you've heard this story, giving him this coat, this coat of many colors or whatever it was, ornamental robe that kind of highlighted, this one's my favorite. Probably not a good idea to begin with, but he did that. Um, And so here's Joseph, this favorite son, who has a gift like his father for dreams. God speaks to Joseph through dreams as well, revealing future of what he's going to do. And so Joseph has a series of dreams that we're told about at the beginning of chapter 37. One, he's out gathering wheat with his brothers, and in the dream, his sheaf of wheat stands up straight, and all 11 other sheaves that kind of fall down, bow down to his. Uh, In another dream, the sun and the moon and the stars all bow down to him. And Joseph, I I mean, sometimes I can't tell where he's at. Um, Seems a bit clueless many times, but he decides, sitting around the kitchen table at breakfast, to tell brothers who already know this is the favorite son, that he tells them about these dreams. Hey guys, listen, I had a dream. Crazy. Listen to what it said. And, and, and so they already hate him. Now they really hate him. Right? They hate him even more. And so a few days later, um, Joseph's brothers are out tending the sheep in a place called Shechem. And Jacob sends Joseph out to go check on them. They go see how your brothers are doing. Do they need anything? And so he goes. Um, they've moved on to another place called Dothan. And so he just happens to meet someone who's like, oh, yeah, I heard them saying they're going to go off to this other place. That's where we'll pick up, second half of verse 17 here. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him, throw him into one of these cisterns, and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Then Reuben, this is the oldest brother, heard this, and he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. And Reuben said this to rescue him from them and to take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornamental robe that he was wearing. Think about this. He actually wears the robe out to visit the brothers. I don't just sit there. I found this quite funny as I read this this week. Like, he's actually wearing the robe out to see them, which is crazy. Anyway, they they tear it off him, took him and threw him into a cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Verse 25, as they sat down to eat their meal, think of the callousness of what's going on. They've just thrown their brother into an empty well, and now they're sitting down for lunch. Um, And as they looked up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices and balm and myrrh that they were taking on their way down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. How nice. Uh, And his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled up Joseph out of the cistern, sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Reuben returned to the cistern, saw that Joseph was not there. He must have been out somewhere at the time, tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? And they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered it, 
uh, slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine to see if it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph is surely being torn to pieces. Yeah, sure. And Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Now, story continues. As Joseph is here in Potiphar's house, he... he gains favor in Potiphar's life. He rises to the top. He's like the chief servant in the place, has like ownership over so many of the things. Problem is, Potiphar's wife takes a liking to Joseph and keeps making these sexual advances to him. Finally, one day, she just tries to force the issue. Joseph's like, no, how could I ever dishonor God and my master like this? Takes off, but as he leaves, she grabs him by the robe and he just Let's it leaves it behind. Well, now she's got this piece of evidence. She goes to Potiphar, you know, forlorn that she, she can't win her plan and says, this servant came in and tried to sleep with me, but I screamed and so he ran off. Look, I've got his robe here. Potiphar doesn't know what to do. Puts him in the jail here in his house um, with all of the other uh, prisoners of Pharaoh. Two uh, prisoners in particular that Joseph gets placed with um, as he has now over time risen to fortune in the prison. He's like the top prisoner. He's trusted by the, uh, the warden of the prison. So the warden's like, I want you to take care of these two in particular. These guys have come right from Pharaoh, a cupbearer and a baker. Now these guys also have dreams. One of them not so good, the other one pretty good. And Joseph says to the one who's good, he's like, hey, when you get out of here, talk to Pharaoh for me. Like, tell him to get me out of here. Um, unfortunately, yeah, when he gets out, he completely forgets about Joseph. Joseph spends another two years in prison, just rotting away. Finally, until Pharaoh has a dream one day, a lot of dreams going on here, Pharaoh has a dream that nobody can interpret, and suddenly the cupbearer is like, right, oh man, I, I actually know a guy. I know a guy who's really good at interpreting dreams, was supposed to tell you about him a while ago. Sorry about that. They bring Joseph out. He interprets the dream perfectly. Uh, As God gives him the interpretation, he says, what your dream means is we're about to have seven years of bumper crops. It's going to be amazing, overwhelming crops, and then seven years of famine. And so what I'm suggesting we do is let's build storehouses, store up as much grain as we can, and then when the famine comes, we'll have more than enough grain to get us through, and we'll sell to everyone else who doesn't have food either, and we'll be rich. Pharaoh is so impressed, he's like, man, this guy, we need this guy on our staff, puts him second in command, right underneath him, as far as like favor and stature in Egypt. All goes well, everything happens just as Joseph said, and then two years into the famine, who shows up at the door but his brothers, looking for food. Now, they don't recognize him, right? Joseph is all Egypt up, he's all speaking Egyptian, and nobody, they don't recognize who he is, but he, he recognizes them right away. He's like, oh man, here we go. And Um, He puts them through a series of tests, kind of see, are you guys any different? Are you still as awful as you were 22 years ago when you sold me? And it turns out they have changed. They are different. Uh, Judah, the guy who agreed and suggested they sell him into slavery, he has the most beautiful and passionate speech to Joseph uh, in order to ask for his favor. And finally, this is where we'll pick it up. If you look now at chapter 45, we've covered a lot here, but now... These first couple of verses of 45. In response to this impassioned plea from Judah, then jo- Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Uh, Yeah, as you would be. And Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now don't be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. 
For two years now, there's been famine in the land, and the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. Listen, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. That's God's word. Okay, that's a lot. Let me pray for us quickly. Dive into this spirit of God. Open our eyes. Um, Give us wisdom to see what you're saying here, to understand what this is revealing. And I pray it would just be transforming. It would work powerfully, this word, as we consider your working in Joseph's life and in ours. Accomplish the good purpose for which you sent this word today, O God. And as I always ask now, eternal God, would you move and govern my tongue to speak your truth? Amen. Everybody loves a good uh, underdog story, right? I think that's true of most people. I haven't met the guy yet who's just like, no, I hate those stories. I hate hearing about people who aren't doing well making it. Um, And yet something I wonder if we ever really stop to consider and think about is like why we love those stories so much. Why do we love them? Um, A lot of different reasons, I think, but I think one of the main reasons simply stated is because every single one of us has been an underdog at some point in our lives too, haven't we? Maybe even currently we are. And so we hear those stories and we're like, oh, yeah. We resonate with them personally as we hear them. Now, this is just kind of one example uh, of many, but I think, for instance, it's one of the reasons why we, we, uh, people love the song so much from the musical Les Miserables. If you've ever seen this before or heard it, I think it's one of the reasons we love the songs from that musical so much. Not just because of their musicality alone. I mean, they're beautifully written songs. We, we love them. But because of the way we relate to the sense of powerlessness communicated in the lyrics of the songs by so many of the characters. Like just think about from that opening song with the, you know, the guys are all in the labor camp and they're singing, look down, look down, you'll always be a slave. And, and then to, to the masses of poor, struggling every day just to make it, at the end of the day, you're another day older and that's all you can say for the life of the poor. You've got the Eponine with her unrequited love, one more day here on my own, one more day with him not caring. To, to the agonizingly beautiful lament of Fantine, I dreamed a dream in time gone by, when hope was high and life worth living. I dreamed that love would never die. I dreamed that God would be forgiving. But the tigers come at night with their voices soft as thunder as they tear your dream apart, as they tear your hope, as they turn your dream to shame. I had a dream my life would be so different from this hell I'm living. So different now from what it seemed. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. Right? I mean, we, we listen to that, and we're not just like, oh, what a, what a beautiful medley. Or, and, and, and nice sounds for the songs. We're like, oh, man, I, I get that. I, I know what you're singing about. I've lived those lyrics, even if I haven't lived those same circumstances. Which is why, in the midst of these underdog stories, think about this one. When the main character of this story, Jean Valjean, an underdog just like the rest of him, he rises to a position of social and political power and then sits in the ultimate seat of power as he holds the life of Javert, this man who's mercilessly hunted him over the years. He holds his life now in his hands. And there's something in us when we see that it just wells up in us, and we're just like, yes, <laughs> that's right, in your face. At last, now, somebody, one of these monsters is going to get what's coming to them. It's kind of weird. There's like kind of a wee, awful glee that comes up in us when we think about their suffering now. They're the ones now that are going to be cowering and begging for mercy. And I don't know, I think that maybe there's something, there's probably something that's holy and right about that. Feeling, you know, there's a sense of justice being satisfied, and there's probably something that's not so good about it. Uh, the point is, that's the power of underdog stories. We, we resonate with their suffering, and we rejoice with their triumphs. And probably the, these stories, they, they just give us hope that our seemingly inescapable circumstances, there's, there's hope to rise above for us too. Right? That, that as hard as our life might be at present, these stories give us hope that there's a better happier, more successful chapter of our story that we just haven't gotten to yet. Which is something, maybe in the clearest way of any other place in the Bible, that Joseph's story holds for us as well. Joseph's story is an underdog story too, isn't it? 
And sure, I mean, I think we can see early on how Joseph brings some of the difficulties that he experiences on himself, right? I mean, the guy, the kid seems as, as clueless as he is entitled. But we, we, we mourn with Joseph. We mourn with him at some of the truly awful, difficult circumstances that he experiences as he experiences injustice after injustice at the hands of the powerful. And then we celebrate. We celebrate as Joseph gets to the better, happier, more successful chapters of his life, revealing that his dreams of greatness as a boy weren't the product of just some youthful hubris, but they were actually the definite plan of God to send him ahead of his family in order to preserve life and to preserve the covenant promises given to Abraham. And as it relates to that definite plan of God in particular, this outworking of a divine plan and story that Joseph clearly couldn't see as it was happening, but which eventually made sense of all the hardships that he endured, I want to spend some time together today looking at the origin of providence. The origin of providence as we continue in this teaching series origin story. And and that word providence, if you don't know, it just simply is the idea that God organizes all the events of our lives in such a way that his good purposes always come to pass for his glory and for our good. That's the general idea of what we mean by providence. Now, exactly how detailed is that plan? How detailed are the purposes? Hmm, The Bible doesn't say. And it's actually really beyond the scope of this message to try to explore all the possibilities. But, like, I mean, sometimes that's the question we ask, right? Like, I mean, what is, is God's plan going to be? Does it include whether I go to White Spot or Chipotle for lunch after church? Does it include whether I will or will not find that parking spot close to the door, the shopping mall at Christmas? Again, the Bible doesn't say. But here's what we do know. Here's what we do see. God is absolutely, we see him throughout the Bible and especially in the life of Joseph. He's at work in the seemingly meaningless details as well as some of the deeply painful circumstances in order to accomplish his good purposes. We we do see that clearly in the life of Joseph. Which means, listen, even with that much knowledge in hand, um, at least two things are true for the follower of Jesus. And actually, if you don't remember anything else I say today, I hope you remember this. First of all, with that knowledge in hand, what that means is, I forget who said it, but it's true. Uh, It means we should never get off the train in the middle of the tunnel. You ever heard that before? Don't jump off the train in the middle of the tunnel. Which is just to say, uh, when your story seems darkest, the activity of God seems most incomprehensible, hold on. Hold on, there's more to your story that's yet to be revealed, which, no, it doesn't mean that your life is now going to turn out like you hope. There's going to be some happy ending. We don't know that, but there's more to the story yet to be revealed. Don't jump off in the middle of the tunnel. And secondly, what it also means with that knowledge in hand is, as, as Keller put it once, it's entirely possible to be following God faithfully and still feel like he's trying to kill you. That's totally true as well. We absolutely see that in the life of Joseph, right? He's he's trying to honor God, follow him faithfully, and all these awful things keep happening to him. The Bible's trying to say those two things are not incompatible. They can both exist at the same time. And yet, as you think about Joseph's story, exactly like Valjean in Les Miserables, when Joseph gets to that climactic moment in his life, when the tables are turned, Right? He's now this underdog is sitting in the seat of power. He also responds in a different way than we would expect him to, right? And although it's not clear exactly when Joseph finally becomes aware of God's plan and how it's been working in his life, I think it's when his brothers finally show up for food in Egypt. Although it's not clear, it seems that realization of God's plan and purpose working in his life sustained him And it was the thing that enabled him to be able to respond with mercy instead of judgment to his brothers. Something about that awareness totally transformed him. And no question, listen, just like with each story that we looked at in this series, um, Joseph's Old Testament story, it's going to help us see and appreciate the New Testament story of Jesus in a way that we wouldn't if we didn't know about this story. But my hope is that in understanding how providence was at work throughout Joseph's story, we'll also become aware 
of how it may be at work in all of our underdog stories as well in a way that's both sustaining and enabling to us. In order to help you see that and begin to grasp that reality in your life in a way that I pray is truly transforming for us today, I want to look at this passage together in just two ways. I want to talk about the hidden nature of providence and then the transforming, or sorry, the empowering grace of providence. Those two things, the hidden nature and the empowering grace of providence. So if you close your Bibles, can you turn back to that passage, Genesis 37, around verse 17. Follow me, follow me as we dig into this next origin story together, the origin of providence. Okay, so let's look first of all at the hidden nature of providence. The hidden nature of providence. And I think we need to start here. We need to look at this first because for many of us, likely for, for Joseph through the majority of his life as well, the idea that God has any idea at all as it relates to our life story, that there's any plan whatsoever, it seems entirely unlikely. Yes? Can anyone else testify to this? I mean, uh, I think the majority of us, we genuinely struggle with the idea that there's this predetermined plan that God is working out in anyone's life individually or in the world in general. We're just kind of like, really? Because without meaning to be irreverent or, or, or unspiritual, I think a lot of us, we look at the story of our lives up until now and we conclude either that God has no plan at all or he's a really bad author. Like, that's not how I would have written the story. This, this is not working out well. Which is why it's so incredibly important for us to understand the hidden nature of providence. We, we need to get this right off the bat. That is, God's work in your life is rarely obvious as it's happening. Did you know that? This, this plan, working out of God, it's rarely we can't see it as it's happening. Right? It doesn't come with an explanatory handbook that's unpacking all the redemptive purposes behind each moment. We just, we, it remains largely hidden for us as it's happening. So that's an important point to know. What I mean by that is like, look at, think about Joseph's life as we look through the various events that took place in Joseph's life leading up to that high position in Egypt. Favoritism from his father. Hated by his brothers. Rescued by been from being killed, but then sold into slavery by Judah, achieving a high place in Potiphar's household, then falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, thrown into jail where he's honored, but then forgotten. All these things again and again, there's no indication whatsoever that Joseph has any self-awareness of God's purpose and plans as any of this is happening. There's no indication at all. You don't see Joseph like <laughs> winking at heaven each time he's betrayed, abandoned, abused, as though he had some like, I, I, know, I know what you're doing, don't worry. He doesn't. His life's just really hard for a long time, and then it gets better. But he's given no explanation in the meantime. And yet, as we see by the end of this story, everything has to happen in this sequence of events, or everybody dies. Because, right, Jacob and his sons are already two years, they're only two years into a seven-year famine, and they're already out of food. So if things don't happen this way, everybody dies. Keller puts it this way. If, if Joseph had been saved from the thing he wanted to be saved from, like pulled up from the cistern, not sold into slavery, he would have been lost in a more profound way later on. He had to be lost in order to be saved. We see that because we get to see the whole story, right? But he doesn't see it. But, but, he, but here's, here's the key to unlocking a greater awareness of providence in your own life. Although the plan of God is hidden from Joseph for the majority of his time, here's the thing. Look, it's not hidden from us. It's not hidden from you and from me as the readers of Genesis, right? From the specific details that we read at the end of chapter 37 there, where we, it's, it talks about the ongoing narrative. Meanwhile, as all this was happening, Joseph is taken here. He's sold to this specific person, which tells us however done Joseph's story felt as he's like being carried away on this caravan to Egypt, the story is not done. It's continuing to develop as God has planned this to go on, along with the repeated refrain that you see throughout Joseph's harrowing story. We hear again and again, but the Lord was with Joseph. 
the Lord prospered Joseph. The Lord granted Joseph favor in the eyes of, on and on and again. We hear this again and again, indicating God's intentional working in and through all the seemingly incomprehensible circumstances of Joseph's life in order to bring about this promised end. So we see it, even if Joseph does. And I think the entire point of that revelation is not at all trying to vindicate God for all the difficult things that he ordained that Joseph would have to experience, but so that you, so that me, reading the account of his life recorded in the Bible thousands of years later, might be able to rightly conclude, huh, hmm, If God was working in the life of Joseph this whole time in order to bring about this glorious conclusion that he had in mind and that he knew needed to happen, even though Joseph was completely unaware of it the whole time, then maybe, hmm, maybe, just maybe, God's also at work right now in my circumstances, even though I can't trace his hand anywhere either. I think that that's absolutely, I mean, it's a great underdog story, All those things are true, but I think that's the gift of Joseph's story. That's the hope to be found here for us today, to witness clear evidence of God's working towards a particular good end in the life of someone who in the moment is completely unaware of it. It's intended to create hope that maybe that's exactly what's happening presently in your life as well, even though it's hidden from our view. Okay, so that's, that's the hidden nature of providence. We need to see this. We need to know it's rarely, if ever, going to be obvious as it's happening. So when we know that, then we can say, okay, so it's okay. It's okay if you don't understand right now. It's okay if it just feels hard and meaningless. That's all right, because you're not going to see it in the moment. Sometimes it takes the perspective of life to realize what was actually happening. Last thing I want to look at together with you is the empowering grace of providence. The empowering grace, and what I mean by that is what it is that an awareness of providence enables us to do once we have it. What is an awareness of God's providence and working in our lives enable us to do once we have it? Because if it's anywhere near the level of what it enabled Joseph to do, it's going to be spectacular. It's going to be good for you and for me as well. Because look again. Look again at the interaction Joseph has with his brothers. Flip over now to chapter 45. You look at this interaction he has with his brothers. Look at just the grace and forgiveness he's empowered to extend to those who treated him so shamefully 22 years ago. There's an account just before this where, where they, they're starting to feel guilt about what they had done to Joseph. And maybe like, this is why all this bad stuff is happening. And they're like, didn't we listen to him like begging for his life in that well? And we just ignored him. They treated him so shamefully. The only way... Honestly, the only way anyone can respond like this, the only way Joseph can respond like this, certainly, is if he has some sense, some sense of awareness of the providential working of God that led him up to this moment. I think that's the only way he can respond in this way to them. Because think about it, in most books, movies, plays, stories, whatever, this, this is the delicious moment of reckoning, isn't it? You've got those people who so shamefully treated you in the palm of your hands. Now, this is the good part, right? When the tables are turned, powerless have now become the powerful, and justice, really vengeance, is unleashed in full measure. That's what, that's what happens in these stories. And yet, look, instead, Joseph abandons his position of power, humbles himself by revealing his true identity. I am Joseph. It's me. And then look at verse 5 and following. I love this. While acknowledging the reality of their offense against him, that they sold him into slavery in Egypt, right? This is important, right? He doesn't just sweep the offense under the rug, like, ah, let's not worry about that. I'm just glad to see you. He acknowledges what they've done. He forgives them. And he calls them to abandon their guilt, abandon their fear with themselves for what they've done. Why? How could he do that? How could he do that given all he'd experienced? Well, look at verse 7. He says, Abandon those things. Why? God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth 
and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Did you see it? Right? It wasn't at all that Joseph is just this kind-hearted, magnanimous individual. Right? He just wants to let bygones be bygones, offering really cheap grace in order to just like preserve and bring about some kind of future peace. Right? It was an indirect response to his awareness of God's providence that empowered him to respond like this. Because he could begin to see, oh, this is what you were doing, he can respond like this in, in a way that doesn't make sense any other way. And no, I don't think that means Joseph, he had this complete, full, comprehensive understanding of all the workings of God. I don't. But I think he had enough. He had enough of a sense of it that he was able to see there was more at play than what he previously understood. It wasn't just, my family hates me and treats me horribly, and I've had to suffer. He began to see, oh, there's more going on here. When it comes to your life and mine today, I think the exact same thing is true. I don't think any of us gets a full, comprehensive understanding of the providential working of God in our lives this side of heaven. But, I, but, but just look here how even a sense of it, just even a sense of how God is working, radically shifts Joseph's perspective from being able to just see nothing but the painful circumstances of betrayal to now seeing a bit, that there was a greater purpose being served by all the stuff he had to go through. And the question I want to ask you to consider in light of that is, how might a sense of God's providential working provide a different perspective on the tangled, confusing, at times deeply painful story of your life up until today? What might that perspective empower you to do? I think we can at least ask that question now in light of what Joseph's story reveals. And I think that's truly the transforming power of it. It allows us to kind of start thinking that way and ask that question at least. And something else I truly love about this story is that it's, it's realistic about how reconciliation takes place, which is super helpful, particularly if that's something that awareness of God's providence empowers you to begin considering. As you think about people who have perhaps been a part of injustices that you have experienced, what would reconciliation look like? Joseph's story shows us what it really looks like. Because look, at no time in Joseph's story are we called to just kind of forgive and forget. For, forgive and forget. You know, don't, don't, don't dwell on past offenses and just play nice. No, right? Again, at least twice in this interaction alone, Joseph brings up the specific offenses against me. You, you sold me here. And you sold me, actually. He brings it up twice just in this passage alone. Uh, uh, elsewhere, later on, after Joseph moves the whole family to Egypt and his father Jacob dies, this is where Joseph classically tells his brothers, you intended to harm me. You meant to harm me. But God intended it for good. You intended this to harm me. God intended it for good, providing one of the simplest expressions found anywhere of how divine sovereignty and human responsibility can both exist at the same time. You're guilty, and God meant this for good. Don't, don't, don't twist that. I know a lot of times people quote that verse and say, you, you meant it for evil, but God used it for good. That's not what it says. It says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. point is, when it comes to this idea of reconciliation, don't ever let anyone tell you that forgiveness means we just need to practice some kind of group collective amnesia together, right? That someone would say to you, hey, look, if you've truly forgiven me, um, don't bring up past offenses, abuses, anything anymore. We don't, we don't need to talk about that anymore. That's, that's not at all what reconciliation is. That's not what the Bible presents it as. This is just one example of many that you would see here that would say, no, the exact opposite is true. We need to be willing to talk about the offense in order for forgiveness and reconciliation to truly happen. You've got to acknowledge what happened first. But along with all that, as we've seen each week, there's something else the story of Joseph offers us. It offers us an Old Testament preparation to better understand the New Testament story of Jesus. And I just love looking at these parallels too. For Think about this. In Peter's very first Sermon at Pentecost, 
following his own reconciliation with Jesus beside the lake, if you remember. Where, for the record, Jesus brings up Peter's specific, specific offenses of denying him. Before he restores him, Peter recounts another story of divine providence, a story that, that which also was intended for evil, but which God intended for good, stating this. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus, listen, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by lawless, the hands of lawless men. Again, later on in Acts 4, he starts by quoting Psalm 2 and then gets into it. It's, Why did the Gentiles rage, the people's plot in vain, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed? For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles, the people of Israel, listen, to do whatever your hand and plan had predestined to take place. Do you see this? The greatest act of injustice of all, and which appeared to be the greatest defeat, where the truly innocent Son of God, beloved by His Father, was betrayed by His brother. He was stripped naked, left in a hole, sold for a few pieces of silver, falsely accused, imprisoned. The parallels are, are uncanny, the amount of things that cross over. So many parallels to which the story of Joseph points us. And also, which then became the greatest of victories. What looked like the greatest defeat became the greatest of victories. And it, will be, it happened according to, as we're told here, the definite plan of God for the preservation of life and the saving of many. As the prophet Isaiah had dreamed centuries before about Jesus when he said, he saw, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. The only difference is that where Joseph was unaware of the providential plan of God for his life until his dreams came to a beautiful fruition, which is probably likely the only thing that enabled him to go through all that stuff and not just give up, Jesus comes to earth, takes on human flesh with full knowledge, full knowledge of every betrayal, every injustice, every whip, nail, and spear carrying out the Father's will would involve for him, and yet he chose it anyway. As Jesus says, John 12, my soul is troubled, but what shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour. For this reason I came. This is the purpose I came for. All for the preservation of your life and for mine. We, we may never have a full, complete understanding of all that it costs Jesus to carry out the plan of God for our salvation in this life or the next, but may our awareness of what it cost him and that he endured and that he, he knew he would endure. He knew the plan and he followed through it in any way. May that empower us to run the race marked out for us with perseverance, trusting that his plans for us are, they are to prosper us and not to harm us. And that he truly does work all things for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his good purpose. Amen.